Disclaimer, this film is not rated and contains scenes not meant for a younger audience. Viewer discretion advised. Okay, that's so cool. That was really cool. All right. I just figured out how to screen capture. This is The Walking Dead Saints and Sinners on a PlayStation VR, no less. What makes dystopian entertainment so engaging and oddly relatable? I think we like to often put ourselves in the shoes of the people we see on screen for cathartic reasons. <laughs> Oh shit, I killed a person. An extreme release of emotional tension. Games like Saints and Sinners, The Walking Dead, and The Last of Us are probably reasons why I like these games personally. They're fun and they help me take out my aggression on one hand, and on the flip side, they can be so brooding, abrasive, hopeless, and downright terrifying. You have got to be shitting me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, Jesus! Hey, there's a guy. Today, we'll see if our topic for today's video tapped into anything I just said, and if so, was it what we wanted? This is like the day one, like the old, I, I have the oldest PSVR known to man. man. And no, it's not a VR game. It's just a bad indie movie that's pretty infamous among my friend group. In a game where you drink yourself to sleep, I guess it put me in the mood to watch a part dystopian, part survival horror movie. So let's call this intro a nice segue and not a ploy to hop along the Last of Us hype train so the algorithm can look my way for once. I didn't feel like a dork at all doing that. That's right, it's the Matthew Pacman directed Margo. This movie's boring as shit. I'm gonna put another disclaimer here. I'm not trying to pick on anyone or bully anyone. I am solely objectively looking at a piece of art and just seeing how it impacted the world around it. So there's certain parts of the movie I would love to touch on, but this video would have been way too boring without me throwing in a little something interesting because this movie has no antagonist, very little dialogue, and a very small cast. And I had fun making the jingles video, so this only made sense, you know? Link in the description. To help me overcome this challenge, I got in touch with someone from this movie. And I am so excited to get into this video, you guys. You were in a little movie that we're gonna talk about. I was, a little indie movie I've done. That was like one of the first things I did with my shortly lived acting career. Uh, it was a lot of fun. This is Brady Sudemeyer. He plays Grant in the movie and his co-star Lauren Schaubert plays Libby. And I hear you saying, why is this movie called Margot? Well, we can get into that later. We got to walk, we had a little red carpet debut there, um, friends and family, we had a decent turnout. Well, after all these years, how do you personally feel about the movie? Because, well, kind of like you said, everyone needs to start somewhere. You know, if you're pursuing anything creative, you have to start somewhere. For sure. And especially in small towns, like where that acting scene isn't huge, I would recommend if anyone was trying to get into something like that in an area where that stuff may not be hugely popular, Pop an indie film. I'm sure there are someone around who's interested in making movies. Cool process to kind of get behind the scenes to see how this stuff is made and what's going on. And I may have forgotten to mention that this movie was shot just mere miles away from where I grew up. So, with Brady to help me analyze the movie, let's finally start. Margo. We cut to an opening shot of Libby hobbling along on his makeshift crutch. He finds a farmhouse and booby traps it, then falls asleep. This movie is supposed to be set in a vaguely dystopian future, but I have no idea what made it dystopian, so I asked Brady for some clarification. I listened to like the commentary, had the making, like I looked at everything about this movie. Uh -huh. Matthew was like, people have seen this genre of movie so much that people would just assume what the story should be but like yeah. there are some points where libby will yeah. say the rise happened or there was fires i didn't know if you could fill me in that's that's something that i i also talked about with him and part of that it, it was more like he wanted to leave it up to the viewer's imagination it wasn't too established into something else it's like he didn't really care about what happened before he was so zoned in on this one character's story that we didn't do a whole lot yeah. of pre-development or post-development afterwards. Mm -hmm. it, it was really left up to viewer interpretation. I'm gonna jump around in the plot a lot because this video would be over an hour long if I just went chronologically. So they're trying to loot stuff, um, but they run into some people. Trappers. Clever name. And to the people that are upset with me that I skipped the first 10 minutes of the movie, well, this is what you missed. <sighs> We're gonna need 
a shit ton more to barter with once we get to the crossing. See? Are you happy? You missed. Oh, shit. They evade these trapper people and they escape this building. Forgot to mention this movie is almost two hours long. Matt's so, uh... What's the word I'm looking for? He has big aspirations every time he comes to make a movie. So he starts off with a short film. Uh-huh. And then the finished product ends up being like two hours. That's actually a big criticism. I'm like, I feel like uh, this would have made a great short film if it wasn't almost I, two you know, that's, hours. That's what I said after I, I actually, because I hadn't seen it movie until I walked into the premiere. I wanted to experience it fresh with everybody else. Okay, cool. There, I'm like, Holy cow, this movie's long. They run away into the woods. They film the whole thing, but luckily they escape by the skin of their teeth. We made it. We made it. Free. We made it. Free. I told you. I think we're home free. <laughs> The trappers shoot Libby, and then we're on to part two. Also, after this point, the audio stops going into the left speaker. I don't know why the movie is like this. Um, how did this all begin? Did you come to Matthew, or did he come to you? And is there an, is there an audition tape as well? There actually was not. I did not have to do an audition tape. Um, if I did, I would have held on to it and hit it. Seen a couple of Matt's short three-minute film that he'd made, mm -hmm. and my co-star, Lauren, was actually... He asked her to be a part of the movie because he'd seen us in a local show. Right after that, he's like, I, I've got this new indie project coming up. I would love both of you to be a part of it. Um, read a couple pages of my script and tell me what you think. We cut to the farmhouse. Libby finds a convenient Walmart sack full of water and she mourns the loss of her boyfriend. And that's why we find out his name is Grant. We're on a day three shave. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, day four is stairs. Um, she can't go up some stairs. Day five. <laughs> day five is wounds and heal. Brady makes an appearance again as a ghost and is haunting uh, Libby's brain. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to go back to this. This is not rated. Not rated movie, so literally anything goes. Do you mind if I say, Lauren, like you guys? No, no, were... no, no, no. Okay, so you guys were dating like during the filming of this. Uh, About it's, halfway. Okay. I can't. It's it was her boyfriend at the time. There were actually a few days where he had actually showed up to set, mm -hmm. and his presence um, really affected Lauren's acting or the way the shoot was going because he was uncomfortable with this or he didn't want her doing that. Matt had actually asked him not to come back to set, or he told her he was not allowed to come back. Honestly, respect. Like, if it's affecting yeah. your craft, you don't need that. My yeah, qu my question was day three, shave, and it's a scene <laughs> where she's touching herself. How did you feel about that personally? This was actually a point of contention that Lauren and I both had. His intention of the scene is like, oh, this is what Libby does whenever she thinks of, of Grant whenever mm -hmm. he's gone. First of all, that's not really a, how people react whenever they're thinking of somebody who's gone. Yeah. It's a weird side thing that Matt insisted on having in the movie. They were so exaggerated. We're not, because she's like, well, Matt, that's not really what that would look like. And he's like, well, I need it to be exaggerated for the camera. I need it to look like yeah. people understand what's going on. I'm like, we think they'll understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it goes on for such an uncomfortable amount yes. of time. So, yeah, that was a point of contention from both myself and from. I don't know if his goal was to make the, the viewer uncomfortable, which I think he kind of was. He, in fact, succeeded. Thankfully, we're greeted with a nice change of tone. Uh, both Lauren and Brady are great in the scene, especially Brady. He's pretty funny. And she only fucks missionary stuff. <laughs> They're trying to guess who lived in the house and what kind of backstory they had. I don't know. I like this scene. Which is quickly curb stomped by this party scene. Uh, I guess they got some cool shot. Okay, that's just silly. She wakes up the next morning and we're on to day six, seven. Oh. Find a. You have got to be shitting me. Part three, Desolation Game. I'm gonna be honest, I don't really think this movie needs parts. It lost so much of its individuality in mm -hmm. trying to copy a Tarantino formula. So now you're automatically comparing indie movie Margot to a Quentin Tarantino film. And whenever you're making that comparison the whole time, it's really tough to like mm -hmm. hold the candle to, you know, Oscar nominated films, yeah. million dollar budgets. 
that constant throwback in your mind kind of prevents the movie from standing on its own. And I think the same can be said about a lot of these new reboots. It's hard to stand on your own when you're constantly reminding people that their predecessor was the king, and since they're here, you're obligated to like this new thing. Man, I am on fire with the relevancy. Esoteric reference! We cut to staring at a bowl of oatmeal for some reason. Oh, she got up the stairs. It was almost like that makeshift crutch was preventing her from getting up the stairs. Goes into this room and finds the anarchist cookbook. We'll get into that bit later. Oh, she was was using the oatmeal for like baits what the fuck is she doing she stakes out the bowl brady being the voice of reason saying that if she keeps this up and wasting her supplies she's not gonna make it you can't keep this up it's not worth it it's worth it to me this is one of many irrational things that she does just for companionship and the movie really drives in this point and it's honestly so sweet, it's sickening. In this scene, we get some pretty cool shots. The lamp was pretty neat. Brady gives a great delivery, and so does Lauren. My goal as an actor in that is not to like fulfill my own dream, but to help his vision come to life. Right. And so that's really what I was, I was more in a supporting role for him. And Libby finds not an animal eating the bait. No, it's a person. Part four, the face of God. It's a flashback uh, after she got shot. Honestly, great prosthetics. And again, Lauren gives a great performance here. She really digs deep for these tears. Unbelievable. What, it's not all bad. After that though, she hears some bells ringing. Um, we never know where they're coming from. And this is when the movie transitions from color to black and white. Ooh, I wonder what that signifies. So six months to shoot. And is that including editing, like post? No, that's not including editing. I think he edited it for an additional four months. Um, and he didn't even tell us that, about the, the black and white, the lack of color that he was going for. We had some absolutely beautiful colored shots. And then when he threw that grayscale on, you, love, you lose a lot of that visual impact yeah. um, for a tool that he was using to signify which timeline. I also feel like he was trying to convey loneliness and, you know, existential dread with the black and white. And it just, uh, again, it's its own worst enemy. It stands in the way of it being, like, something better. I think I think there's a lot of things in this movie that are like that, where the, it, the movie does become its own worst enemy. Oh, like, for sure. Like you brought up. The, 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 the length, yep. those color things, um, some of those weird scenes that go on for much longer than they need to. The, I, man, I got so many more questions. I've got time. I've got lots. So, I've got nothing to time. Libby goes inside this building um, and pulls a gun on this blind lady just sitting in the corner. Put it down, child. Oh. Don't need it in here. Other than Brady, she's the best character. I don't know if he, if he mentioned in the commentary, but uh -huh. Libby and the blind woman, ever, ever in the same room. They, they were, were even in the same state. Are you shitting me? Never met her. The only time we met her was like over Zoom calls. She was just fantastic. I was about to, she fucking killed that. When she first spoke. Put it down, child. I was like, man, I love her voice. Like, it's just. She's got a great voice. It's great. And that's wow. one of the things that you learn in, in behind the camera is film acting. Yeah, you're blowing my mind. Two people who've never met are now in the same room in the movie. It's crazy. Libby and the blind lady, which we never know her name, are camping out in the building. Funny, we're eating dog food when you got candies in that bag. Lord, I can see. Hey guys, she's blind. Libby and the blind woman have a heart to heart and she tells her uh, what happened to her and then um, they go into how Libby makes herself feel better. I used to write these lists. Every day I'd write a new list. The blind lady upon hearing this uh, gives her a Crayola marker and says this. Let's get back to writing then. I'm, I'm going, going to vomit. Libby for some reason rubs the dirty marker around her mouth. Oh, I love checklists. And that's the last we see of the blind lady. It's truly what it means to see the face of God. Whoa, whoa. She puts the candy bars down on the floor for the lady and then somberly walks away. And then I fast forward four minutes. I'm making you watch this. This is four minutes of nothing. Nothing is happening. You're wasting four minutes of my time and everyone else's. She's taking a bath now? Okay, um, she gets caught in a trap. Sounded like it hurt. Are you kidding me? That's what you're limping about? That it's That's nothing. Am I just, am I being too harsh? Part five, the locket. Libby's trying to track that mysterious woman that was eating her food, and uh, I think it's a good time to bring this up and remind you guys that we have not seen this Margot for an hour and 10 minutes. We are an hour and 10 minutes into this movie, and we have not seen the main focal point of the movie. 
what is happening? Start singing for some reason. Um, I guess that draws out the mysterious woman because she finds her in this opening. Um, the lady tackles the shit out of her. Brady's ghost comes back again and asks a very valid question. What in the blue fuck? were you thinking? You can't be so desperate for companionship that you're willing to die for it. Say something! I say when it stops. Again, great rebuttal. This character has not made any sense at all. If it seems like I'm being too hard, I'm sorry. I can only imagine how hard it is to have a lead role and carry the whole movie on your back. And this just kind of revolves back to the point of the movie's its own worst enemy. Very little is happening and there's very little to work with. So I don't blame anyone in this movie for trying to make the most out of a bad situation. No offense to the writing, but just the lack of flavor text in the beginning just honestly kind of says a lot about the writing. I swore I'd protect you. You're my girl. Not anymore. Ooh, tough break. Oh, that's it? Okay. Libby finds the mysterious woman's camp, leaves some food and a comic book. Um, I'm guessing this insinuates that that was her trap from earlier. Just calm the fuck down, okay? Libby always pulling a gun on someone. Uh, she charges at her with a knife. Uh, doesn't make sense. She obviously gets shot. There's a chase. She finds her again. Uh, she grabs a box cutter, grabs this, the locket. Libby stabs her and um, has a mustache now. She goes back to the farmhouse and inspects the locket. It doesn't have a little Marco. Uh, okay, I'm really gonna speed through this. Okay, so she heard something, it scared her. Uh, turns out it was that lady leaving guts on the front porch. This scares her so much, it causes her to have a Home Alone style montage with the Anarchist Cookbook, which I will get into now. Pretend that I didn't tell you this, even though there's direct video evidence of it. Um, <laughs> but it's called the Anarchist Cookbook. Okay. It basically teaches you how to make homemade bombs, traps, and survive uh, apocalypse. It's, it's, a, it's a very controversial book that's available to purchase to anybody. It actually shows her making these bombs. It's nuts. All the while, she's monologuing to her dead boyfriend. I was gonna go to New York, remember? Be a fucking ballerina or something. I keep having the same dream. In it, I'm alone, and I'm dancing in the dark. <laughs> Oh, guys, this scene's in color. It's because she's doing something she <laughs> With two shotgun shells duct taped to the end of a broomstick, she's ready for anything. We cut to a radio it Oh, no. No, if this radio starts playing obscure metal music. Libby starts rubbing blood all over herself from the guts that Margot left on her front step. <laughs> oh man, and then the director tells her to shave her head for some fucking reason. Margot's trying to get into the house. Did she just fall asleep? Yeah, so Margot gets in the house. That's supposed to mean something. Um, I don't know what that was for. Oh yeah, she ditches her revolver for the broomstick from earlier. And I still have no idea what that did. Um, some fighting went on. She got her locket back. It was that, wasn't it? That's why you came after me. It was all a big misunderstanding and they're best friends now. You think Margo would just stab her at this point. It's winter now, and you want to know how I know? Because they literally just ripped this from The Last of Us. Anyway, it's winter. Uh, she goes back to Margo because they're a little duo now. I got breakfast. Margo totally just blows her off and she's, she's just as happy as a clam. Another day. I'm going to scream and that's it. That's the movie. I'll hit you with a few more questions. Anyone take any inspiration from The Last of Us when they were make when Matthew was making that movie? Rip, hey, John, I can you. I can yeah. a thousand percent. You can definitely tell he started writing that movie almost immediately after finishing The Last of Us. That is so like, funny. Matthew Patman is a very avid game. The Last of Us was stunning. Tell in the wardrobe. I was dressed like Joel. I had the green, I, even down to the green flannel, man. That like, is so funny. Um, but a younger, angstier Joel. It shows a little bit. You, you can definitely tell where it Oh, I, I made two kids. notes. I had no idea. I made two notes. I was like, did someone, did he play The Last of Us? Because he just he did. ripped he did some of that game. That's so <laughs> he, funny. Art, art imitates art sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Good artists borrow. Great artists That's right, steal. that's right, that's right. 
I saw the movie won awards like in Miami and yeah, LA. it did really well at indie uh, indie film festivals. Lauren actually won two awards oh. um, at the Miami Film Festival. She won Best Lead Actress. Uh, she still has the award. They actually mailed it to her. Matt had just submitted this thing that any indie film contest, any indie film celebration anywhere over the country, and like it it premiered in over like 500 different festivals oh wow and I, yeah no, it was it, he matt did a dud had done so much work to get this movie out there you said so the merch um how many t-shirts did you guys sell <sighs> somewhere around like 200 that's pretty that's pretty all right yeah no and, and, and i think they cost us like 700 dollars to make because matt was good friends with one of the print companies mm -hmm. so we, we ended up splitting about two thousand dollars or so and he posed for the merch and stuff could we throw a picture up there of quick? course yeah that so it's a shot of you and lauren you're talking to her about something and if you look closely on your front tooth you have like a speck of like pepper or some kind of food in your mouth <laughs> i don't know if you knew I, I probably had no idea again we'll leave it we'll just say it's decay <laughs> it's it's uh it was intentional it was intentional i had no idea no idea um, this is my friend's copy right here. Oh, the hardcover. The hard, yeah. <laughs> Lauren actually autographed this DVD. Um, I remember you saying that. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll flip it or I'll do a better shot. May you always enjoy my shitty acting. That is fantastic. That is very in character for her. <laughs> she has maintained that energy throughout the years. And I respect, I respect it. Just a preface for the video, I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not bullying anybody. This is a solely an objective look, and honestly I was curious on your experiences and what you had to say about it, because when I was a kid I always wanted to be in a movie. I wish that your guys' ambitions went into something greater, but like I said, I know you guys gotta start somewhere. This was like years ago. I met Lauren at a bar. I was like, not really starstruck, but I was like, I have to say I liked her in that movie. And um, I went up to her and I was like, I really loved you and Margo. And she took it the wrong way and she said, fuck right. you right to my face. And I was like, oh yeah. no. So that's that's really funny that you bring that. She, whenever you told me uh, uh, like a few weeks later, whenever you told me afterwards, I was like, oh, that's, I get. Because in our area, that type of movie, again, that type of scene isn't super popular amongst the local population mm -hmm. and so anyone who's seen it didn't really understand it when she'd run into somebody in public who had seen it they would go out of her way to tease her about it so she could oh, the defense mechanism where anybody brought it up it's like oh great now i have to defend myself again. yeah so when you come up to her and you tell her that you genuinely enjoyed it that's like <laughs> and i thought what? about and as soon as she said that i immediately felt bad because i was like oh my god people probably gave her so much crap for it objectively i thought that was really cool that you're both in a movie if it wasn't painfully obvious before brady and i are actually friends and we kept in touch after all these years hey. what's up buddy hey i missed you so much um, I don't know if I told you or not, but uh, I'm currently living in a military dorm. Okay. Uh, I work for the government now. You're one of, you're one of the you're, you're one of the best employees I ever had. You're the best <laughs> friends I've had. So. Oh, dude. Now I'm here. I, I'm here for it, man. This video would not happen without this interview. I, I love stuff like this. Like again, I, I will support anybody who wants to create anything. I love that. Anytime you need anything, man, I'm always here. I got you. I talk to you forever. It's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, fine, literally. I was kind of nervous at first, but I'm like, is, why am I nervous? Like, I don't know. We worked together for so long. <laughs> I guess I didn't want to be a fool, but this turned out really no, awesome. Never. Never. My first time watching Margot, I was really surprised to see Brady in this. And after the Jingles video, I thought this would be a no-brainer and I could interview Brady and see what his experience was like shooting an indie movie. But what turned into a jab and another bad indie movie turned into something that actually inspired me to make content. Hearing Brady talk about Matthew's passion and drive for making movies, it was honestly kind of hard not to get inspired and encouraged to keep making stuff. Um, he, he just lo he just loves making movies and he's, he's so open to like working with anybody so long as they show interest. How old is Matthew? Oh God, it's time, late 20s, early 30s. For how old he is, he's still got that drive, he's still got that passion, he's oh, still yeah, yeah, persistent, no, I, like that's I mean, awesome. You can, you can always tell. You can always tell with people who are like extremely passionate about it because the second they start talking about their passion, 
they go from however old they are back to a teenager. Like, just yeah. thrilled to talk about it. That's, uh, that's, that's honestly really cool. If you peel back the layers of this movie, you could see that a lot of care went into this. This was someone's passion project but on a budget. And it's actually kind of fun. You know, here's a little snippet of what my life was 10 years ago, what I was doing um, at the time, mm -hmm. what I looked like, what I sounded like. And again, a lot of those aren't even, you have to change so much that mm -hmm. uh, it's not even you anymore. For those, for those interested in getting into it, you are going to meet some real scumbags. Uh, I, I ran into a couple early on. It's, it's some like Harvey Weinstein-esque type of guys. People are just trying to use each other a lot, but there are a few good people in that industry that genuinely want to help you. One of the best ways to navigate it is to get an agent. Agencies work really close with casting directors, and it's very stressful because you never know when your next paycheck is coming. But for those who are trying to get into it, I'm going to say stick it out. Uh, if it's something that you truly wish to pursue and it genuinely makes you happy, you're going to run into some scumbags and perverts, but ignore them, move on, and stay focused on positives. And when someone has those good intentions, you, you, you should do your best to stay in touch with those people. A thousand percent. I mean, that's why I still keep in touch with you. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. If you could say one good thing that the movie did, what would it be? I think my favorite part was finally getting to not just be an advocate for local arts, but to actively participate in them and be a part of that local art community. It's, it's such a tight-knit community, and once you enter that, uh, with those filmmakers, with those bands. It's just to get involved in that network was great, and I, I couldn't have been happier about it. Not every movie is going to be good, but I think that from those experiences, you almost learn you almost learn more from those flops or from those things that uh, you might be a little embarrassed about, but if you go back and you look at it, you can see the foundations of what you're trying to do with your future and how you can get to there. So like, it, it's a cliche, but don't be afraid to fail and stand proudly by anything that you've done. Whether you like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, just stand by it, be proud of what you've done, and you've added something to the world on top of it. Uh, fantastic. This could not have gone any better. Um. <laughs> You give a great interview. Like, the, the, thank you. Prep, I was not expecting you to be so prepared with an entire notebook. So. Oh, absolutely, man. And, and that's what I'm talking about with that level of passion in people who are trying to create something. Like, it, it shows in, in yourself and uh, and everything else you do. So, I mean, I, I love that. So, anytime you have anything, I'm always like, I will be here to support my man, Dude, Tyler Perkins. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Of course. I think at the end of the day, the film was made for a very niche audience, and it's going to be for those people who like those very vague, very open and loose interpretations of things. But again, that's not for everybody. I mean, you, can, you can talk to two different two different people about anything. And one person's going to love it. One person's going to hate it. At the end of the day, though, you, again, you just you put that thing out there for people to have those emotions about. So yeah, that that's the goal is to just make something. Wait, did that actually just work? What? <laughs> I didn't think that would work. Oh shit! Ah oh, shit! <laughs>